Hi there. Um, we're doing another video on time series forecasting. I am sitting next to my pug Delilah and you can hear her snoring. I apologize. That's the sound she makes. I can't change it. So we're doing some time series forecasting and what I'm trying to look at here is a general approach to what to do with time series data and a forecasting problem and then more specifically we're saying when we see a trend how do we use linear regression to estimate what our next point on that linear line is going to be? This data is from an article called Forecasting by Wheelwright and Winslow, available through Harvard Business School Press for $7 and something. If you're reading the article and you're following along in their example, you'll notice that the answers or the slope of the line and the descriptive statistics will vary a little bit from what they got and that's because the numbers that they're using are actually have more decimal places than mine do so it's just a rounding issue but the methodology will be the same. So I put together this brief list of instructions. What do you do when you've got time series data and actually you could use this for almost any kind of data and it's a pretty good place to start. The thing that we begin with is just identifying in mentally describing the variables that we have, what unit of time are we working with and what's the variable being measured? In other words, what does our data set look like? We have three variables. We've got date, we've got year from 1991 to 2007, and then we've got year index T. And what year index is, and, and T is the time subscript that we would use to denote it, but 1991 is our first year, 1992 is our second year, 1993 is our third year. Sometimes you'll see that, sometimes you won't. And then our third column is sales, measured in euros. In a brief eyeballing of this, we can see that sales have, are having an increasing trend between 1991 and 2007. We can see that they don't necessarily increase every single year, like 2000 was a great year, but then there was a decline in 2001. So we've identified and we're getting a sense by looking at our data. The second thing is to calculate descriptive statistics and create a plot that will just allow us to, do a, to get our head around the data. What type of values are we looking at? And so usually with descriptive statistics, I do um, some sort of measure of central tendency. I'm going to do average. And then some sort of measure of distribution. I'm going to do standard deviation. And then I always look at the minimum and the maximum values and I, I do a count. Here it's easy, but often in data you don't know how many observations you have and you're going to want to, to, want to do that. So my average is equals average. I click on the first box and then I hit command shift down arrow and I close it off. For standard deviation, I'm going to do standard deviation of a sample. Same thing, command shift down arrow. The minimum, min, max, and count. Great, so these are my descriptive statistics. I'm going to adjust that standard deviation to have fewer decimals. So our average is 532 with a standard deviation of 166.67. That seems to indicate that there's quite a bit of variability in this data set. Let's plot it to see what it looks like. Highlight the data including the titles and then under insert choose a plot. Here we go, sales in euros. I'm going to change that title Oh, sales and euros. No, I'm not going to change that title. I'm actually going to change nothing about that graph. And from here, we can see that we have an increase in sales over time. Right? We've got an inclining trend in the data. And so to plot, to forecast, selecting a forecasting method, when we have a trend, we can estimate the next point on a line in a trended series by using linear regression. And I'm going to create that plot and I'm going to put my answer here. So that's what that box is for. All right, so before we do can move forward, we need some extra information. We need the parameters for our line and each line is going to have an intercept 
and it's going to have a slope. And if we have the intercept and the slope, we can use those two points to make our forecast for next year. So our intercept equals INTERCEPT. And then it's going to want two inputs, the known Ys and the known Xs. And our known Ys are going to be our sales in euros. And we can see that here. It's on the Y axis. So what's on the Y axis is sales in euros. And on the X axis is our year index. So our intercept is 251.4757. I'm going to reduce that so it has one decimal place. And then my slope, I can use the slope formula, known Ys, known Xs. I'm again going to reduce this so that it only has one decimal place. When it inserts those values into our formula, it will use all the decimal places, but I just want to make it easier to read. So our forecast for 2008, I'm going to label it, can be found by using the slope-intercept formula for a line. So our intercept is 251.5 plus the slope multiplied by that year index. So our forecast for next year's sales are $813, sorry, 813 euros, 0.7 euros. To get that euro on there, I'm gonna have to make some changes. And you can just scroll down until you see any euro. There we go. So that's my forecast for next year. One thing that I like to do with forecasts is to evaluate how well this line would have worked predicting past points on the data. And to do that, I make a historical forecast. And I put historical in parentheses because you can see when you get to, I'm going to put the historical forecasts in column D, but when I get to the bottom, I'm going to have my actual forecast value. So all these are going to be historical, and this is my forecast. So my historical forecast is my intercept, but I'm going to hit Command T if you're on a PC. That's F4. So my intercept plus my slope, again, Command T or F4, times my year index. So my forecast in euros for last year, for the first year based on this formula, this slope intercept formula, would have been 282.7. Again, I'm going to put it in currency. I'm going to tell it we want euros last time. Okay. And then once I have that forecast, just drag down one box to make sure that the numbers, that your values will match mine. But after here, we're going to calculate our error, our absolute deviation, our squared error, and then our absolute percentage error. And I'm going to just calculate these straight across, and I'm going to drag the whole thing down. So my error is the difference between what the forecast would have been and what the actual value was. If I had used this, this slope and intercept to calculate sales in year one, my forecast would have been 282.7. And if I take that and subtract from it the actual value of sales in euros, I realize that I was off by 2.71 euros. I overestimated. My absolute deviation is just simply the absolute value of that error. And my squared error is the square of that error. So you use the caret, which is shift six, and then you put the two, and that puts that two in the exponent. And then my absolute percentage error is equal to the absolute deviation divided by the actual sales. So that's how far off was I as a percent of what we actually sold in euros. So let's take a couple of these things. Actually, let's take this whole row and grab the corner and drag it down and we're going to stop right before our forecast and then we're going to format some of these cells. So when it comes to things that are expressed in euros, actually some things that are expressed 
in any number, I'm going to revert to one decimal point because that's what I have in my original data. And then my percentage error is not expressed in euros. Rather, it's expressed in percent, and I'm going to give it a decimal place. In these cells here, I'm going to highlight them. What I'm doing here in this final row that's green is I'm going to calculate the average error, the average absolute deviation, the average square error, pardon me, that decimal point is bugging me, and my, app, my average absolute percentage error. And these things are called mean error, mean absolute deviation, never mind, mean error, mean absolute deviation, mean squared error, and mean absolute percentage error. And the formula for that is average. I'm going to calculate the average error. And let's take a look at what it tells us. If it gives you extra values here, don't be fooled. They're not real. They're, they're not what we want. So here our mean error, I'm going to add a couple decimal places actually, is zero. That means that on average, this linear regression produced an unbiased estimate. What that means is that it's not, it's an, it's an informal term actually. It's, I use it to describe the tendency of a forecast to over or underestimate systematically. And so this regression does not do so, right? Our error historically has overestimated and underestimated at the same frequency and the same magnitude so that those positive and negative errors average out. That doesn't mean that the average is, it, that, that it's hitting the value on the nail head every single time, right? That's what the absolute deviation will tell us. And if I scroll that average formula over one column, I can see that on average, we're actually off by 43 units. So our historical sales forecast, we're, we're over and under the same amount of time, but we're still off by 43. So we're misestimating sales by 43 units. We can drag over again, both for the squared error and the absolute percentage error. But the one that I'm more interested in is the absolute percentage error. And this tells us that we're off by 43 units, 43 euros, but that's 7% of our actual sales. And so we talk typically when evaluating a forecast. Our mean error lets us know whether or not we're likely to over or underestimate. So it tells us if we're hitting the bullseye, if we're centering around the bullseye, or if we're centering a little to the left or to the right of the bullseye. Whereas the mean average deviation, the mean squared error, and the mean average percentage error, those tell us more how close we are to the bullseye in distance. So you can have a forecast that centers a little to the left or to the right, meaning it's often over or underestimating, but it can still be relatively close, right? So it's not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's just understanding whether or not your forecast is likely to be precise. How far is the forecast in distance going to be from the forecasted value versus whether or not it tends to be above or below the forecasted value. So if we take a look down here in terms of my instructions, I would say that you talk about in your mind at least or write it down the type of data you're looking at. The variable being measured sales in euros. Calculate some descriptive stats so that you get a sense of where you're going with the data and what the words are to describe what's going on. And then choose a forecasting method. When we see an incline like this, linear regression is going to be our best guess. And then we prepare then the, we forecast the next period's data. When we're using linear regression, we need to get the parameters of our line, the intercept and the slope. We use that for the forecast. Then we create a historical forecast and calculate the average errors and the errors so that we know how well the forecast would have performed historically, and that'll give us a sense for how close we think we're going to be in the future. And so here we did this, and we can talk about how well the historical forecast fit the data by saying that while it centered over the average level, it wasn't biased, it still tended to be off by about 43 units or 7.7% .7 of average sales where our forecast was off. So that's about all I've got for you on this video. Let me know if you have any questions.